to our monthly webinar. My name is Justin Cooper. I'm a hard money and full-time real estate investor. Each month we bring in some of our friends in the industry to share their expertise. This may be through a presentation like when we talk about self-directed IRAs or title insurance, or we may simply interview our expert friends and dive deep into how they got started, where their investing has taken them, and what they see coming both for themselves and for the industry. Now, I want to say thank you to everyone for, who made it to tonight's event. We know you're giving up some of your precious time, so Charles and I will do everything we can to bring the value that you're hoping for. Now, this webinar is brought to you by Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial is Colorado and Minnesota's premier hard money lender. Pine focuses on the needs of Colorado and Minnesota real estate investors, and we're investors ourselves, and we know what it takes to get deals closed. Everyone at Pine Financial Group is dedicated to the success of our clients. We only experience success when our clients are succeeding. So we have a habit of telling you when a deal should or should not be done. And isn't that what you want from a professional in the industry, especially someone that you trust as an advisor? You will benefit from our honesty and integrity when you choose to work with us. Now tonight's webinar brings in a friend and investor, Charles Roberts. Charles Roberts is president of both Your Castle Real Estate and Shorewood, Shorewood Real Estate with a combined 700 plus agents. He's a registered appraiser, licensed realtor, and a former loan officer. He's invested in Denver real estate for the past 20 years, completing dozens of fix-up projects along the way, and currently manages his own portfolio of properties in Metro Denver. His specialty is helping investors buy cash flow properties. It is. <laughs> Charles, go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself before we dive into tonight's conversation. I mean, yeah, not much to add to that. You know, that was very, very nice. I'm just, I'm a real estate guy. I started real estate 20 years ago. I never thought I'd be an agent, but uh, 13 years ago, just thought I'd get a license to be a better investor. And what I found was having been a really, you know, uh, in the teeth investor for years, people wanted to work with us. And we, we started to bring on clients and then agents wanted to join us. And we ended up building a couple of big companies. Awesome. Yeah, it's been fun. I mean, just a blast, honestly. Awesome. Yeah. Well, very good. Yeah. Well, it's been great getting to know you and working with you over the years. Um, Same. Actually, you were one of the folks that helped me take off my career. Uh, Pleasure. Not to age you, but years ago, <laughs> uh, I was going to your Castle Real Estate classes and, yeah. you know, sitting in the crowd, uh, listening and learning from you. Yep. So it's been great uh, having that and then, you know, working together in the capacity of Pine Financial and your Castle work together, hosting the Investor Success Summit. Uh, as well as classes every week, every month. Yep. So it's been great. So tonight, what I want to do is mix things up a little bit. Uh, so I recently bought a rental property, and Charles was my agent. So after closing on the property, Charles had mentioned how he scoured the MLS looking for any deal as good as the one that I bought. Now, not that I'm some amazing investor or that Charles is some rock star agent, even though he is, but it's more so that the market is changing and finding a good deal uh, is a lot harder to find. So I want to start by ta talking a bit about how you as an agent found this mm -hmm. property and then what you did to try and find another property like it after we bought it. So let's start with that. How did you mm -hmm. find this deal? So let me take one quick step back and talk about the, the finger quotes good deal. So this is something that um, I do talk about a lot because the one thing every investor knows about real estate is that you have to get a great deal and that you make your money on the buy. Is that right? Would you agree that every investor Yes. If that's the case, have to buy a deal. And do you know where I'm going with this? I do, and that's okay. why I'm smiling. So and That's why I use air quotes at the beginning, too. So every investor needs to decide the investor they want to be. And I want to say that that is, to me, one of the great myths in real estate is that it has to be a great deal. Of course you want a great deal. The problem is, depending upon you, your strengths, your time commitment, the market you're in and what you consider a great deal. What I have seen too often over 20 years of doing this is people look for a great deal and then they never find one and then they never build well. So you want a great deal if you can get a great deal, but if the issue, if the result of wanting a great deal is you never buy real estate, then I think you've completely misled yourself. So I like to start by saying a deal is what works for you. And as someone who's done lots of different things in real estate, what I have found is the thing that has worked best for me over time is to buy property and to pay it off and to build enormous wealth. So that's, I mean, I don't want to say enormous, but build wealth, right? So that's what's worked for me and that's what works for my clients. And you've bought several properties and you've been building wealth. So the first takeaway from this is make sure you understand as an investor what you're looking to do. But I would suggest the worst thing that can happen is that you believe a deal is something 30% off and 10 years later, you've never bought property and you don't build any wealth. Just, just rethink 
if that's actually what you want to do as a real estate investor, because no real estate investors think that way. They all think they need a great deal and most end up buying nothing. Yeah, I, I think that's a great place to start. And that is exactly why I use the air quotes around great deal, uh, because I know you have strong opinions around what a, a deal is. Yeah. Um, but but let me start I, by saying right now, a deal is something you buy today and you sell tomorrow for a profit actually buy today and sell tomorrow. Everything else is a made up deal. And the fact is it is very, very difficult, certainly in our market, and I would say in many markets, to actually buy and sell a property within a day and make money. Why? Because you know markets are markets, they're fairly liquid. Yeah, so that is Charles's opinion of what a deal is or a definition of a deal. So for me, everything is a deal. I call every single property that comes across my desk a deal. I just bought a new primary residence like two weeks ago, and every time I talk about this property, I called it a deal. Okay. Just because I, I don't, I think I probably even overpaid. But um, right. but every property that comes across my desk, I call a deal. I'm just in the habit of calling them that. So, but I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, it, to, in order for it to be a deal, someone has to define it themselves. What is a deal to them, mm -hmm. and what are their criteria? So I think that's a great way to to start it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's 20 or 30 percent below market or it needs this or it's that. It's what is important to you as an investor, whatever that may Perfect. be. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that 100 percent. So back to this property mm -hmm. that I bought that uh, I'm holding as a rental. Yeah. How did you find it? So um, this was an interesting situation going back to, I think, end of the year of 2017. There was a property on the MLS uh, that I had found with a client. And, um, you know, first off, uh, you know, you can buy properties on the MLS, you can buy properties off the MLS. What I can tell you for sure is that anybody who says you can only buy a deal off the MLS or on the MLS or buy from a wholesaler, it's just all ridiculous. What you want to do is find the right property for you. And if that means it's a wholesale deal, great. If it's on the MLS, great. If it's an auction, great. Whatever's right for you. This property happened to have been on our local RE Colorado MLS in Metro Denver. And the story is I had seen it with um, a client and we had looked at it. And it was a, a, a decent, actually a really a decent, is it a four, was it a four bedroom, two bath? Remind I think me. it's three. Three bedroom, two bath, um, town home with an upstairs, a second floor, a first floor, and a basement, and actually a really nice complex, but it had some problems. Uh, as we discovered, it looked like they were going to have a special assessment because the exterior, I think, was 18 units or something. It's a fairly small complex, you know, and it's run by the people there, and they, they needed to have a paint job, so we weren't sure what the assessment was going to be, and the tenant was a Section 8 tenant, and let me just start by saying I love Section 8 tenants. All of my tenants but two right now are Section 8 tenants, but they were messy. I mean, they were dirty, and I think it turned a lot of people off. So the first investor I brought, great guy, actually, a... a um, very experienced investor. Yeah, he didn't want it. I think they were asking 240. They went down to like 230. We came in at like 210, and and we actually could have gotten it, but he's like, no, he wanted a better deal. No problem. So the next investor I brought in, it was a very similar situation. Um, in my opinion, I felt like they were getting a little greedy, like they wanted it for 208 or 205 instead of 207. And the bottom line is that. The buyer had actually, I'm sorry, the seller had actually bought it about four years ago Was an out-of-state investor. I think he was actually a um, Chinese national, if I remember correctly. And, you know, it, it ended up being a tough deal for him. He didn't want to go any lower. So making a long story short, I had, over the course of several weeks, brought in two, you know, mature buyers. Neither of them wanted it, and I respect that. And then I get a phone call from you. <laughs> well, so you found it on the MLS. It right? was on so the it was, MLS. It was on the yeah, MLS. just a simple MLS property. So what about this deal when, when you as a real estate agent are yeah. looking on the MLS, what about this townhome said, I need to look at this closer, yeah. I need to maybe present this to one of my clients? So the numbers were great. Um, so we use I use a spreadsheet. I like a cap rate. I look at cap rates, internal rates of return. Um, cash flow, and all the numbers were really solid for our market. It was better than average. The reason was the price was, depending upon what we ended up getting at, was was lower than would be expected because we had a potential special assessment. We had a tenant who, you know, she was not unpleasant, just dirty. And then the truth is, um, it was a this was a home that is not necessarily a rental. There's lots of owner ops there, <clears throat> but because they had a relatively long term lease, an owner op couldn't buy it because they couldn't move in within 60 days. Yep. So it just had a number of factors that were killing the seller. So the seller was dropping the price, 
and the two buyers I brought in just wanted more and they didn't get that more. But really simple, just kind of doing a basic analysis of the numbers. I mean, we're talking about 20 seconds of typing, coming up with a couple of numbers and saying, hmm, let's go check this one out. Gotcha, gotcha. So after closing, uh, we, we've talked about this property a lot um, because it is probably one of the, the better deals that were out there on yeah, paper. Yeah, we, we ended up right? loving this of, darn deal. Yeah. There's a lot of other stuff like you've been mentioning that kind of goes into this, but on paper, looking at the purchase price, looking at the rents, it's a very strong deal. But after closing, and we can talk more about the deal in a second if, if you guys want, um, but uh, after the deal, uh, you went out and tried looking and scouring the MLS, trying to find another property that was as good, that yeah. had numbers like this. Yeah. So what did you do then? How did you, what does that mean to scour the MLS? You know, it's not that difficult. I mean, it's, you know, it's a database. And, and if you have, you know, Zillow or Redfin, so we have something called RE Colorado, which is our local MLS in the front range of Denver, wherever you are. If you're an agent, you have some version of the MLS. But the truth is our clients have more access to stuff than we do. I mean, Redfin, awesome website. Go to Webfin, you know, check it out. I mean, if you go to Redfin <coughs> and you type in four search criteria, that's what I do. That's that's it. We're not. It's not rocket science. What what is the important point though is that you understand what you see. Typing in a couple of things and getting some numbers and properties. That's not the trick. Everybody in the world can do that now. What is important is understanding your market and even more importantly yourself for what you're looking for. And that's the thing that I really try to counsel my, my buyers. What are you looking for? When someone comes and says they want a deal, I, I don't know what that means. And worse yet, they don't know what that means. That means they're never going to buy anything. So I would counsel you and anybody listening to understand what it is you're trying to find. Our job is to try to match up what someone is looking for, their expectations, and help them find something. And when you called me on this property, I don't know if you remember, but I remember, I'm like, Hey, Coop, what's happening? Yeah, you know, I actually have one that could make some sense. I've been back and forth on it for several weeks. Let me pop this over to you. And that's exactly what happened with this. And yeah. That's all we did. It, it, it had been maybe three or four weeks of my trying to find somebody and getting a little frustrated thinking, how come they're not taking this? I think this is a really solid property. And then the timing was right. I think it was the beginning of the year or something. Mm -hmm. And you called me and I said, let me, let's analyze this. And you were very quick to move. Yeah, so I was planning on buying something in the beginning of 2018. So I just kind of wanted to get the ball rolling. I think we had uh, connected November or December. Uh, I think the first time we chatted about it, I was actually on my way up to the mountains to go skiing. Mm. And um, uh, but you were looking at it with a different client. Oh, and then, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, so a couple of weeks go by, and we reconnect, and your other clients had passed on it, mm -hmm. uh, and you said, "Hey, this one's still available." And so we, we started diving in and looking at the numbers. And um, so I have spent some time. I, I already own rental properties. I've done some fix and flips. I've built new construction. So I had a good idea of what a good deal is to me and what my criteria were. Exactly. We've had lunch together. We <laughs> see each other frequently through classes and other events. So we've discussed what my criteria are. So you had an idea that when your other investor had passed on it, yep. that this might be a good fit for me because you work with several investors. Um, and so we connected on it and, you know, I trusted you and the diligence that you'd already done. Yep. And then of course I verified that and went through my own diligence, uh, and everything just kind of seemed to keep checking the boxes and moving forward. Yeah. So, uh, and I can compliment you because I mean, you said it, but I will, I will reiterate it that you, that you touch base when you were ready. I talked to you a little bit about it. You said, great, let's go check it out. And you made the decisions that were right for you and you got a property that ended up being Honestly, a great property for anybody, but but importantly, a good property for you because you didn't just read a book and then go and look because if you had done that, you would have had no perspective. No, you're a professional. You've seen hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of properties, and that is what separates, I think, someone who makes money in real estate with someone who doesn't is they spend the time, they obsess, and they understand what it is they want. I, I appreciate that. Uh, um, it's true. But I would say to be determined on how great a deal this is, we, I've only owned it for four months now and so well, let's, let's there's a lot about, of ugly things about some this numbers. property. Yeah, I know, but let's talk about some numbers. Let's hit it. Let's yeah. Hit it. So, um, so like you were saying, appraisal, I think it was a, for example, let's <laughs> talk about the purchase price and the appraisal. Yeah. So I think, uh, speaking of buy a deal today, sell it tomorrow and make a profit. Um, so originally the property was listed for two four, yeah. right? Uh, and through some negotiations and you getting to know the property and you know, probably other listings and showings, they started dropping their price a little bit. 
you had uh, other clients offering less than the I think one of my guys came in at 200 and they came back at like 207 and then he didn't want it okay he didn't want it yeah yeah but those were the numbers i was actually shocked the denver market is super super hot i this was almost unique to see a, a drop in price this big and this is why i was getting so excited about it but yeah my guy pushed and he didn't get it yeah so first sign right a very motivated seller yep absolutely um so that was a good sign uh but when you and i had chatted you had at this point uh had some experience with this property talking to the listing agent uh, and you thought that if we had offered 200 on the property that we would be able to get it, but there would be some stipulations, right? Um, yeah. I think the seller was tired of it falling out of contract. I think it had fallen out three or four times maybe. Yeah, a bunch. Um, and so they, they just wanted a buyer that will perform that had done their diligence before, or the majority of it, before they wrote the offer, and they weren't going to give any more concessions, right? You could still do the inspection, they said, but you're yeah. not going to get any money back. So in, in Denver, we call it an as-is inspection, which is essentially a gentleman's agreement. You put into the contract and say, we're buying it as-is. And what it means is we have the full right of inspection, and that means if we don't like it, we can terminate the contract and get our earnest money back. So you as a buyer are protected. Mm -hmm. Me as an agent is doing my job, making sure your earnest money is protected. What we're saying, though, is if we have a problem with the property, we're just going to cancel the contract. We're not going to nickel and dime. And it's a it's a it's a nice way of proceeding where each side should behave and say we're going to do a quick inspection and if we don't like it we'll get out and we were able to do that and you know basically explain to the seller that that we weren't going to waste a lot of their time and try to knock another thirty thousand off and that made the seller feel much better about the low offer which he didn't feel too good about right yeah exactly so that that certainly helped. Uh, and made our offer look strong. We knew that that was important, right? Our My agent had reached out, was discussing with the listing agent, what are the motivations, what's going on on the seller side? One of them was they didn't want to get beat up anymore. They wanted just that as is kind of uh, offer. And so that's what we got. Uh, and so that's what we presented and we went under contract. And so then we started working on our diligence. So they wanted 240. Uh, most of the units in the complex were going for around 240, a uh, comparable property, yep. and we were under contract at 200. So that sounds great, right? It sounds like we're getting a discount, but obviously there's a reason for that. Yep. So first and foremost, right, the property's worth what somebody's willing to pay for. Absolutely. So is it worth 240 or is it only worth 200? That's maybe a, another discussion, but, um, but for me, this was gonna be a rental property. So the next thing I need to know is if I know what I'm buying it for, what are the rents? right? Does it hit those numbers, my criteria, a good deal, right? What was that? And so it was, it is rented at $1,896 a month. Yeah. Uh, Section 8, I think Section 8 pays $1,850. Like mm -hmm. And so the tenant is responsible for about $50 a month. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they've been there a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, there is still six months left on the lease. And, and through chatting with them they wanted to stay even longer yeah. so okay nice place. so yeah so that 1896 sounded like it was going to be continuing um so first off you know that's one of the first things i look at as, in my criteria is you know what is in this case the grm right some people call it the one percent rule uh charles calls it the grm i now call it grm because gross rent multiplier gross rent multiplier so we're just looking at uh what purchase price versus rents mm -hmm. Or if you're looking at the other equation, then it's rents versus purchase price. So it, they're just inverses of each other. It's the same formula. Though. So 1% or a GRM of 100 would be the same same deal, same property. So in this case, the GRM was a 105. So very close to that 1% rule, right? It'd be like a 0.95% uh, if you're doing the 1% rule. So that kind of jumped out at me because at the time, I had criteria of a 130 GRM or better which is quite typical in our market right and so actually the more i was talking to charles about it it sounded like the market was creeping up to a 150 grm it, it really is and on multi-units it's across the board that kind of thing yeah so first and foremost you know it, the grm sounded amazing i guess at, you know for the market now maybe that's because we're getting a discount whatever the case was but that's one of the things that we were looking at so that's the first step uh and based on that we made the offer we went out there and we started looking at it uh, yeah, the exterior, the siding looks horrible. Yeah, I mean, it, needs, can, a you, lot it, it needs a lot of work. No yeah. question about it. One of my clients that I brought out, a guy named Rick, he actually used to own a painting company. So I said to him, look, give me an idea, Rick. And he also turned it down. 
but he, he had just started and he ended up buying another property. I said, just give me an idea, like a ballpark. What do you think? And he said, 50,000. I said, okay, great. So let's just double it, call it 100,000, say there's 20 units. We're looking at probably something like a 5,000. I mean, total back of the envelope type of thing. But I'm thinking, you know, maybe a $5,000 special assessment might cover it. And that's the way we begin the process to cover ourselves. And it's not a $50,000 special assessment per unit, you know, maybe 5,000, a little bit less. Does it still make sense at that point? Yeah, and so the special assessment, what we're talking about there, I don't, as the owner of the townhome, I'm not necessarily responsible for the exterior, right? The HOA is the homeowners association. So one of the things you'd have to do on a condo or on a townhome is do your diligence on the HOA and make sure, uh, well, you're looking for several things. Everybody has different criteria. So the reason we're talking there might be a special assessment would be if the HOA does not have enough money to pay for the new siding or the painting right. or whatever would have to happen there. So in this case, they had just replaced the roof within like the, the past year. Uh, and there was a surprise sewer issue, which cost several thousand yeah. dollars. And so when I was doing my diligence on the HOA, they only had $10,000 in the bank. Uh, now they were doing things appropriately with the monthly HOA dues, they're setting aside the right amounts for reserves and doing the other things, uh, which is important because when you're getting financing, which I did, I got conventional financing, I just went straight into a conventional loan, uh, that's something that they look at. Is the HOA viable and are they doing things appropriately? Which they were, but uh, they didn't have much in the bank. So uh, if they are going to address the siding sooner than later, where does that money come from? So they would have to do a, a special assessment where they go to all the homeowners and say, okay, it's gonna cost this much, and so your portion is this, and you have 60 months, 60 days, six months, a year to come up with that money, and then after that, when we collect the amount, then we'll go and do it, yeah. or whatever the case may be. But so we knew that there was gonna be a special assessment, and at 5,000, even at $10,000, we're buying it well enough, it's performing well enough, we should be fine. Right. Uh, and talking and doing our diligence on the HOA, they did not have a special assessment yet. So we, no one's coming, but we don't know when. So for me, that says I have a chance to save up more money for when this comes. And so not necessarily me, but the property does, right? If the property's cash flowing, then I can set that cash flow aside and it'll build up its own reserves and be ready for its own special assessment. So that was something that I looked at. Um, some of the other things, uh, just it was just, a dirty, beat up, well used, yeah, well used property. It was just, it was just messy. Yeah, really. Yeah, messy. it wasn't, it wasn't bad. But a there couple was some... of leaks here, a couple of leaks there. You know, <laughs> I don't think it was still leaking, but the evidence of the leaks yeah. were still there. Yeah, just or at least nobody's of, called about it. It was a little yucky. Kind of. Yeah, exactly. It was not a pretty property. There was uh, one or two cabinet faces missing. Um, definitely some staining in the <clears> ceiling <throat> from where there was a leak from the upstairs bathroom. There but on a... the other hand. It was a great layout. Yeah. It was very spacious, very large, you know, so that it just basically, you had a tenant. Yeah. Like, Coop, are you living there? I am then not. Then what do you care? I think I might have said that. To you <laughs> and you didn't care because you're a professional and you understood. You don't care. Right. Right. Exactly. And so in discussing <clears throat> with the tenant, they were comfortable living there. They may have created all of these issues themselves. They uh, <laughs> and so they wanted to continue living there. Okay, so I'm not trying to do a fix and flip with this property. I don't need to get in there and patch the holes and repair the pipes and uh, you know replace all the cabinets so they match and work properly. The tenant is happy with mm -hmm. the situation. Very happy. So all I have to do is make sure it's still safe and habitable, mm -hmm. that it passes Section 8 inspections, and we're probably good for another six months, maybe another year, who knows. Um, so that's exactly what we did. We put together the worst case scenario. This is what would have to happen if the tenant moves out and we want to sell it or you know maximize the rents. But in the short term, what do we have to do? And so literally the day before, or the day of closing, an hour before closing, I did the pre-closing walkthrough uh, and I saw the tenant's mom was there at the unit and I said, hey, would, would your daughter still like to live here? Yes. Is there anything we can do to make it a little better uh, to improve the place right now? And they said, that the garbage disposal leaked. And that was it. And so maybe for what could be a $20,000 yeah. full repair budget, I got away for like 200 bucks. Yeah. Because yeah. that's all I needed or wanted at right. the moment. That and a furnace filter. And I think I wanna I want to point out that, that you, you mentioned something about health and safety. Like you and I 
absolutely take health and safety very seriously. So while the place was a mess, it was it was healthy and, and it was safe. And that I would suggest to you, do not screw with that. Like you want to be a good landlord and you want, I mean, kids are gonna be living there, right? Like you want it. So if there had been something that you felt was unsafe, if there was an electrical wire doing this or something, you would have fixed it. I know you would have, and of course you should. So while we're talking about the place in disrepair, what we're not saying is that it was unsafe. Absolutely not. That is of primary importance. Yep, absolutely. So that was one of the big things that I did, uh, we did, that mm -hmm. the home inspector was looking for. You know, is it safe? Is it habitable? Um, and yeah, and, and so we put together, you know, through the home inspection and, and just diligence of getting in and seeing and being through properties all day, every day, mm -hmm. what will the place need to maximize the value? Great, okay, so I have the wish list, but I don't have to act on it, right? Because right? we're trying to maximize the cash flow. And if I dump $20,000 into it, that changes things right off the bat. Um, so actually recently, I don't know if I told you this, but Section 8 came through and did their yearly inspection. Yep. Uh, a laundry list of things. It took a, a handyman about two days to get it all done. Really? Yeah. I'm actually somewhat surprised, but again, health and safety, there's just money in the bank, just no a bunch of little stuff, okay. right? Nothing big and crazy, Good. but lots of little things. Total of $790. So okay. very reasonable, right? Under a thousand dollars. Section eight is now happy. The tenant is obviously happy. I get to keep Section eight paying. Uh, the tenant gets to keep living there. It's a win all around. And do, do folks know what Section eight means and what by paying means? How you get it in your account on the first of the month? Tell us. <clears throat> so Section eight is uh, basically Section eight of the Housing and Urban Development Code. And what it means is there's several billions of dollars that go to fund housing for people who literally, at least in our market, win a lottery. And the lottery is free rent for life. I'm not kidding, that's what it is. So I happen to like Section 8 a lot because um, my tenants basically pay very little, which means I, as a landlord, I'm getting money from your taxes. That's exactly how it works. And I'm getting it in my account at the beginning of the month. It's pretty much market. Sometimes it's a little higher than market. Sometimes it's a little bit lower, but this is you know, our government at work providing housing. To the extent the tenants actually have income, uh, the threshold is 30% of their income would go to pay the rent. So I think in your case, apparently she makes $150 a month. I just did that math incredibly in my head because you said that she pays you 50 bucks and that means $1,846 show up in your account on the first of the month and then she throws you 50 bucks you know, every now and then. Yep. And that's how it works. So it's something to think about as an investor because every city and town in the country has Section 8. Yeah, and so this is something really interesting. Uh, Section 8, I don't know if there's, it's, it seems to be like a love or a hate. Yeah, right? it so, really is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's like a, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, no, I feel like it's, uh, yeah, it's Charles loved it, right? Love For the reasons he just said. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of folks that hate it, you know, because what type of tenant, you know, potentially would have to be on Section 8. You want to um, answer that question? It, people who need a little help. Yeah. <laughs> but people who also, you know, let their house, uh, you know, cabinet bases fall off, yep. right? And they're okay living like that. Uh, who have seven garbage bags of laundry, not garbage, but just laundry mm -hmm. in their laundry room piled up. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you need to be done or what they're gonna do with that, but that's what was sitting in this oh, uh, laundry room. Um, but how are the tenants themselves? How have they been to you? So for me, just fine. Okay. But this is kind of a, another little tangent we can go down. I have a property manager, uh -huh. so I don't know. <laughs> they've been fine for me, okay. uh, but you know that's why I have a property manager, and I know that they've had some some issues, and uh, that the property manager has had to take some phone calls and work mm -hmm. through some issues with some of the neighbors. But mm -hmm. uh, that's not that's yeah. not my problem. You don't care. Okay. No. Yeah, yeah, the checks keep running it, coming in. Yeah. Um, but uh, I did have one Section Eight tenant who seemed to know the rules a lot better than I did. Um, you know, she was moving out of her place, and there were some issues with it, and she didn't keep it up. Um, and when she moved out, I got hit with a huge renovation budget to the, the dishwasher leaked. And so the place was soaking wet. Uh, there was damage in the basement. I had to rip open walls, dry the place out, replace a whole bunch of stuff. Um, yep, and then, happened. yeah, uh, but I couldn't even turn her in to section eight because section eight is section eight is the national right level, yes. but it's, it's administered by the local, a, a, lo a right. local housing, um, entity that has been given the right to distribute Section 8 vouchers. Right, right. So in Denver, in the metro area here, 
the city of Aurora might be one of the housing authorities. Denver County has a housing authority. And so what this tenant had done was she was living in Aurora. And after she left my place a disaster, she left Aurora and moved to Denver. So now the connection I had been working with for a year and a half uh, was no longer the connection. And she said, well, you can do whatever you want, but I, it has no effect because she's no longer living in Aurora. Right. So you're potentially dealing with professional tenants. Yep. So you have to be an educated which, landlord. Which, by the way, is not unique to Section 8. It's unique to actually being a landlord, which is why I think most people shouldn't be landlords. I honestly believe that. It's a lot of work. And when it's unpleasant, it's very unpleasant. And that's why we make so much money being landlords. Yeah. So it looks like Ross has a couple of questions here. Uh, so now that I bought the home hmm. under the current lease, will you be raising the rent to market value? Uh, I feel like it already is market yeah, value. It really is. I mean, you might want to actually uh, do a rent reasonable to check, but it's a great question. But no, this is this was market value. Yeah, we loved it. 1896 was awesome. Yeah, and so Section 8 publishes. Uh, what rent should be, what is it, based on zip code, number of bedrooms? Yeah, along those yeah a whole so, bunch of criteria. Yeah. yeah, so you can find out what the going rate is. So if you haven't bought the property yet, if you're doing diligence, if you're looking in different areas, you can find all that to figure out if Section 8 is something that interests you, you can do that. Yep. Um, oh, so yeah, do we want to raise it once the lease expires in actually this month so here's why section 8 is awesome so let's say this was you know a you know a couple with three kids and the mom and the dad are working and they're $200 below rent you know you might actually have be a human being and admit it and kind of feel bad that you have to raise the rent and or you might lose a good tenant or they might get violent and leave with the windows and the roof like it can be very, very difficult as a landlord to make those types of decisions. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've read the books too. You're supposed to deal with like a business, but you know, come on, we're dealing with people here. You know why I like Section 8? Because um, your taxes make me rich. Because I just for, put in a rent reasonable list, Section 8 comes out and they say, oh, Mr. Cooper, it's now worth 1956 a month and your tenant has to pay one extra dollar, maybe not even any more. So as ridiculous as it sounds, all the pressure is taken off of us because it's the government looking at their rent reasonableness and it isn't losing a tenant and it isn't feeling bad about charging more rent for someone who may not be able to afford it. But you said it perfectly. It's, it's black and white. Some people hate Section 8. I respect that. I've had bad Section 8 experiences and tenants. Believe me, I've had them. But I haven't found that they're much worse than any other tenant, but I know I'm going to get the rent. So this is something that you're watching. You've got to make these decisions for yourself. Right. And that's one of the things that we've been talking about, right? What are your criteria? Yeah. And every time we kind of pose one of these questions back and forth or to you, uh, these are the things that can go into your criteria. Right, uh, Charles and I teach a three-hour class where we dive deep on uh, investing for the long term and rental properties, and we ask a lot of questions. I feel like that, and we, we might actually disappoint a lot of folks uh, in the class because I think they're wanting us to tell them. But all we can do is ask questions because it's up to you, the investor, to make up your own decision. And by the way, we disagree on stuff, and that's totally cool. Like I manage my own properties, you don't. There's not right or wrong here. It's not that one of us is right. The only person who's wrong is think that there has to be a right or wrong answer. It's all very, very personal. You're a smart guy. I'm a smart guy. We're investors. We do some things differently. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so speaking of, one of the things we differ on is how we analyze deals or what our big criteria is. Uh, so what I had mentioned was GRM. That's a big one for me. Um, uh, another one that's really important for me is cash flow, the monthly cash flow, uh, rents versus the mortgage. Uh, on this one, um, we already said the rents were $1,896 a month and the mortgage is $878 a month. So for me, just the gross cash flow is over $1,000 a month. Now there's HOA expenses, right? That's $200 a month. And for me, I have a property manager, so that's about $150 a month. So uh, for me, when I analyze cash flow, because even then, I use cash flow, but how do I analyze cash flow, right? Everybody has their own ways of looking at that. I just look at the, the bigger gross number. So some people will account for vacancies and repairs and maintenance. Um, I don't necessarily. I just want the less math I can do, the faster I can move. But my criteria is based on that. So, um, so the cash flow and then ultimately for me, cash on cash return is important because that allows me to then compare across the board, different types of investments. How are they doing compared to each other? Um, so Charles is a big fan of cap rates. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, all of these things just paint the picture of how good of a, a deal the property is. Uh, and of course, knowing how to run those numbers and how to analyze the deals is important, but understanding what your criteria is to then know if that analysis hits your criteria or not is almost the more important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's no right or wrong. I mean, I happen to like cap rate. For me, cap rate helps me compare multiple properties. You like uh, more of the how much you're making per month because you want to know what one property will bring to you. And once again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's what you're comfortable with. Get good with it. Go do some stuff. Yeah, and so this actually might be a good balancing point, right? My real estate agent looks at the cap rate because he's looking at the market as a whole. He's looking at five, 10, 100 properties every day that come up on the MLS. So how can he pick and choose which ones are better, best, or just decent cap rate? Because across the board, you're, you're comparing what net operating income versus the purchase price. Correct. Right? So it's not accounting for my personal mortgage, you know, how much down did I put? What kind of interest rate will I get? None of that is factored into cap rate. So it's an easy way to compare this property versus that property versus this other one over there. Which ones are the better ones out there today? Uh, so he can then, or she, Charles, in this case, can say, Justin, here's what? the agents. Oh, okay. Not, not saying you're a she. I was like, well, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll edit your, that part out. Your you know, real estate agents. Yes, I got you. He or she yeah. uh, can then bring you the best properties that they're finding. And then from there, potentially, depending on your criteria, you can dive deeper on your situation and how you're going to finance the property and what you may be improving, uh, if it needs repairs, something like that. Yes. <laughs> uh, so what other uh, criteria do you use when you're at it? Because you're also an investor. So what yeah, other I criteria am. do you use? Well, one, a couple of things. One is what level of work you want. So let's start with that. Let's say I have someone who has a lot of time, really good with their hands, wants to do a project. We might steer them more. We might help them buy a property that they can buy and actually build some equity in. And then maybe have another person who can't work with their hands, has no time, shouldn't be taking the risk of hiring 16 contractors, 15 of whom steal their money. Maybe they should buy a property that's, that's a turnkey, ready to go. That's a great thing to think about if you're an investor is, is what type of property meets your requirements. Another obvious one is what part of town, maybe, maybe how far it is from you, but what level of neighborhood. So what I can tell you is in the, the worst property in the worst neighborhood in the worst condition is always going to cash flow the best, no matter where you are. So maybe you're comfortable with that. I happen to be very comfortable with that. Other people may not be comfortable with that. These are the types of criteria that really successful investors think about. This is what they think about. And what I try to get people to say is, of course you want a deal. We're always trying to find a deal, meaning undervalued. But in the real world, you need to also understand yourself, what your long-term plan is, what your vision is. You don't want to buy a property and hate it and it's too far from you, and it's a scary part of town, and it's in really bad shape, like forget it, you're never gonna buy a second property, and you're not gonna die rich, you're gonna die poor. Don't do that. Figure out what makes sense for you, not because the book said it made sense, and not because the guru at the front of the class said it made sense, actually take control. And I will tell you, that is the number one secret to successful investors, is they take control and find out what's right for them. And I'm very passionate about that. Yeah, I agree, I agree 100%. Uh, with what we do at Pine Financial with the hard money lending, uh, I can't tell you how many times somebody brings uh, a property to us and says, you know, is would you lend on this? Well, whether or not I lend on it doesn't mean you should make the offer or not. You know, how did you analyze the deal? What do you think of, of the deal? Is, is it a, do the numbers work? You know, does it hit your minimum profit? You know, what, what are your criteria and goals? Um, and and a lot of times they don't have those answers. They don't know. They haven't, uh, whether they didn't run the math themselves or they haven't analyzed it, I don't know. Um, and so we use it as a teaching moment, right? This is how we analyze the deal and run the numbers. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that's how they should. So uh, we try to use that as a teaching moment. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely with the number of investors that we see and talk to, wannabe investors, the, the newbies and the experienced folks, uh, we can kind of see and we watch them be successful, the ones who know their criteria, that can move fast, can analyze the deal uh, to the way they want to. I, I was actually just talking to a, a potential client uh, earlier this week, end of last week, um, and they passed on a deal because they were only gonna make $333,000. Yes. 
Yeah. But that wasn't enough for him. And you know what? I absolutely respect that. It was a new that. build. It was not. A developer. It was not. So this was a fix and flip. Um, yeah. It was a fix and flip. But the ARV, the after repair value, what they would sell it for is $2.7 million. Okay. So a very different price point. It's not a first time home buyer. Uh, I know this price property point. actually. Yeah. Yeah. I know someone who bid on it. Yeah. And the repairs were $600,000. Yeah, yeah. 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 So 300,000 sounds great, oh, but I sent her to you. You did. That's why it sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, there you go. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but $300,000 was not enough profit. And so at the first take that kind of blows your mind. How is that not enough? Right. But with a $600,000 budget, in a neighborhood where 2.7 million is the after repair value, and that's probably one of the higher end, if not the yeah. highest end neighborhood in Denver, um, things change. You know, the light fixtures are not $20 boob lights from Home Depot. These are thousands of dollars for one light fixture. You know, the, the needle moves very quickly uh, on that type of property. And so I absolutely respected that investor for saying 300,000 was not enough. It did not hit its criteria. For the risk. For the risk, yeah. Absolutely. For the time frame, for all the variables associated with it, it wasn't enough. And I absolutely respect their decision for that because they had their criteria. They knew what they were capable of and what they needed to do. Do you have a couple questions on that? All right. So are you comfy submitting an offer when multiple offers are on the table? Comfy. <laughs> and the offers are at or above list price. So... Ooh, 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 ooh. Can I do that one? Please, please. Okay, so list price is meaningless. So yes, I'm very comfy because I couldn't care less about list price. Let me tell you, I'm an agent. You think we have any idea what we're doing, that we actually think that we know that list price is market price? Uh, let me just uh, disabuse you of that notion. We're just guessing. So the idea that you wouldn't come above list price honestly means that you don't understand the market. And you don't understand how this works. List price is our best guess. So I have no problem because it's not about list price. It's about what the property is worth to the investor. So let's say list price is $100,000 and the property is worth $150,000. Would you pay $101,000 for it? Indeed you would. That's really what you need to think about, not the list price. Literally do not think about the list price. What you have to do is get good enough and work with people who are good enough to understand what the value of the property is and separately what the value of the property to you is. And list price is at best a rough guide. Yeah, and there's a game being played with those list prices. Some agents may say, I'm going to get the listing because I'm going to promise that we can get you know, $600,000 as the sale price on it. So they market it $600,000. But then what ends up happening is the market says that's too much. And so the property mm. sits, maybe there's some price reductions or some mobile offers and it sits and it sits and it sits. Uh, the other way might be, well, what if we list that same property at 525 and we know that's low, which should definitely go for more, but we're going to list it low to get a lot of action and hopefully get into multiple, multiple offers, similar to what you're probably talking about. And then the price gets bid up. And then, so you could have, and that's the same property. So on the 525, what if it gets bid up $50,000 and it sells at 575? That sounds amazing. The homeowner, the seller is going to be super excited. Uh, but if it's at 600,000 and it sits and it sits and then a price reduction and then a mobile offer and then it sells at 575, either way, the market just said the value of that home is 575, right? But there's very many different ways to approach that. So yeah, I, first yeah. thing we do when we have uh, Pine Financial, we have um, uh, a worksheet called the Maximum Allowable Offer. And you can find it at pinefinancialgroup.com, uh, go under resources, it's called MAO, Max Allowable Offer. And one of the methods uh, has the list price. It asks you what the list price is. And anytime we're in a class and we're talking about this, the first thing we do is we cross that out because it doesn't matter what the property is listed at, mm -hmm. it matters what, what we are willing to pay for it, yep. right? What's so as worth to you. Exactly, Absolutely. exactly. So you need to be able to understand your criteria uh, what are you going to do with it? If it's a fix and flip, what is that ARV? What can you sell that property for when it's all fixed up and beautiful? How much repairs will it take to get there? How much profit do you want on this deal? Yeah. And then work the numbers back and say, okay, well, they want 500000 but I can only pay four eighty five. So that's what I'm going to offer. Let me give you a perfect example. Last night, uh, long story short, uh, I have a house hackers, uh, Zach and his girlfriend, and they want to live in a house, live in the basement. They've done it a couple times. They've built hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity they want to do another one so the property came in up 315 315,000 we knew it was low 
we ended up offering uh, 300, uh, an offer of 335,000 uh, with an escalation to 350,000. At nine o'clock last night, I'm working with Mike, awesome listing agent. This guy's talking to me at nine o'clock at night. We ended up getting under contract for, let's just say about, because I'm not supposed to say, about 348,000. We were the number one of 25 offers. 25 and this property is worth it to my buyers they're going to house hack it they're going to live in the basement they're going to have cash flow they're going to buy another property it's going to appreciate it's the right thing we beat the other offer by just a couple of thousand dollars by presenting a good offer being professional being able to make a decision and I, and this is going to be a great property for them but to answer your question we paid close to 350 for a property that was listed at 315 but it was listed way too low because 25 offers came in above asking price that is the real world yeah, and so Brad follows up, let's presume that the list price is accurate based on the comps, such as in a townhome complex. So, you know, when the, when the property that we bought uh, was listed at 240, and based on the comps, that it was should have been worth 240, right? All the other comps in that complex seem to be about 240. But that on paper says, okay, this size, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage should be worth 240. But then you have to get inside of it. Right? This one's a rental. It's not owner occupied. It's been well lived in yes. for a year and a half. You know, uh, so what are the other factors? So in that case, we were able to get a discount. Now, what if this same property uh, had rents of three thousand dollars a month and it was listed at two forty? Maybe there's one. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. I would have <laughs> <Maybe, laughs> Exactly. I never even would have heard of it. Right. I told you. <laughs> um, but in that case, maybe you could pay more than two forty. Right. You could offer higher than that. Uh, even though the complex says 240 is the number, you could easily have offered 260 because you saw enough cash flow and potential that maybe you could offer higher. So what, what we're saying is, yeah, you look at the list price, maybe it's something of a guide, but the more you understand property, the more you've looked at, more of the hundreds of properties you looked at, you begin to understand what's right for you and you try to package the right offer that makes sense for you, whether that's 50,000 below or 3,000 above, it's immaterial, it's what's right for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so any other questions? Anybody else out there have any other questions? Obviously, we're spending a lot of time talking about rental properties, but we both have a lot of experience uh, working with fix and flips. Uh, if anybody has questions, feel free and uh, throw them at us. Um, Charles, what else? Any other thoughts? Well, what do you what do you say when someone says, oh, God, Justin, I don't want to buy. I think the, the prop, the, we're at the top of the market. You know, mm -hmm. maybe we're in, you know, Seattle or in Boston or New York City or Denver or Austin or L.A. or San Francisco. We're at the top of the market. What is your response to that? Because it's a very legitimate concern and we certainly hear it 14 times a day. Yeah. I, I say, you know, where were we last year? At the top of the market. What about three years ago? At the top of the market. Because that's what everybody says every day. Right. Exactly. So. You know, and, and if you look back through the historical data that your castle does a great job of compiling, um, going back over, I think the past 40 years, 35 of those 40 yeah. were at the top four. of the market for that. Four out of the last 42 years uh, were not at the top of the market. Yeah, so each year, right, the market keeps creeping up, yeah. and then maybe we have a little adjustment, yeah. and then it creeps back up, so we're at the top again, and then top again, and top again, and top again, and then maybe an adjustment, and then a top again, and top again. So uh, that doesn't scare me. You know, what are the other factors that may cause it to adjust? That may be something I want to know. Uh, what are those factors? That's a great question. Yeah. Right? Is, let, if you know, let us it. know. Type it in. You know, we'll, we'll take some <laughs> notes. We'll ask you some questions. Exactly. That's that's the million dollar question right now. Um, but you know, and everybody has to have their reasoning. You know, or what they're looking for uh, in that. And you know, of course, you can go back and. Uh, look at what the downturns will cause the past downturns. Yep. Uh, I don't think it's ever been the same reason twice, but it's something to get your mind thinking, yep. you know, what else should I be looking for? And despite everything you read on Zillow, it's very, very difficult to predict, like pretty much impossible. So I, I suggest to people stop asking that question and stop thinking you can predict it. Start controlling yourself. Go look at 100 properties, go meet some people that can help you and control what you can control and stop wasting your time asking questions that are, that are, in my opinion, unanswerable. Yeah, and so the way I like to say it is if you buy a good deal today, it'll be a good deal tomorrow. And a good deal is whatever a good deal for you is, right? So for me, it's that cash flow number if I'm looking at a rental property. If it hits my criteria today, tomorrow it should still be performing. 
Uh, and for me on rentals, I have a very long-term hold, 30 years plus yeah. potentially. Um, so I can weather those downturns. And it, so what's the worst case that happens? I buy a house today and literally tomorrow the market changes. So if I bought something that hits my criteria that has cash flow and whatever else I'm looking for today, tomorrow in whatever that downturn would look like, I should be able to weather that storm because I should have enough cash flow built in to where if I have $500 a month cash flow and the market says, hey, you got to reduce your rents by 100 bucks, I should still be able to cash flow, right? So I can weather that storm. A good deal today should be a good deal tomorrow. Um, so fix and flips is a little different, but it literally doesn't happen tomorrow. Right, these things, these downturns happen over days, weeks, months, maybe even a year. Yeah, generally years, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at the data, just look at the data. The data is out there. Like, look at the data. It doesn't. It, it's not like Tuesday the market crashes. It's very unlikely. Yeah. So time is of the essence on a rental property. Time is hopefully in years. That's what we're looking at. Right. That's our horizon on rental properties. On a fix and flip, we're looking at months, if not days. I get really excited when I talk to clients who say, I'm going to turn this in 90 days, in 60 days. They're not even using months. They're using days. Mm. So if there is a downturn coming, right, they should be able to get out before it really crushes the market. Right? They should be buying a good deal today so that if the market starts turning in two months, in six months, they should be able to have the margin to still get out. Maybe they don't make as much, but they should be able to break even, hopefully. Next lady wants to know if you loan out of state. We do. So we lend in Colorado. That's where uh, Charles and I are right now. We're in Denver. Uh, we lend in Minnesota in the Twin Cities, uh, same Cloud and Rochester. And we're lending in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee right now. Somebody wants to know about student rentals. Um, so saying they get beat up a lot, but they can be good. Honestly, I don't know much about it. I, I do. I, I know on paper, and I've certainly heard about it. I, I think that people who specialize in that can do really great. They just have to understand, you know, be, be able to be predictable. So great. Kid puts his, you know, head through a wall. Fine. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just drywall, you know, it's cheap. I right. Mean, you scrape off the blood and it's just drywall. So as long as you know what you're getting into, I wouldn't fear it. I wouldn't necessarily be attracted to it. Just understand the numbers and maybe it's going to be a little more tenant intensive or maybe it's not as tenant intensive as yours, but I, I certainly wouldn't say I'll never do student rental. There are people who make millions and millions of dollars on student rentals and other things. It's absolutely worth looking at. Do, do you know anything about it firsthand? Uh, well, I lived in one. Oh, so, okay. All right. <laughs> so I have a little bit of your experience. Head? Yeah. yeah, but that was one of the, before I really knew what real estate investing was, uh, I was in college and I had rented a house and I had some roommates uh, and then the basement was rented out to a separate group of folks. And every, I don't know, two months or so, Joe, the the landlord would come by and he'd bring that's us nice. like a six pack of beer and he'd mow the lawn. That's awesome. I think that was like a subtle way of checking in and that's so smart. Uh, doing an inspection. He had a property manager, but you know he had thirty rentals or so, uh, and it allowed him on a Tuesday to swing by with some beer because right, he was retired. Lawn. Right, yeah, exactly. Because he was living comfortably. Great story. Um, and, and so looking back when I started getting into real estate, I it, I, I recall that and mm. I loved it. You that's know, cool. and it was it helped show the power of or at least what I thought, I never actually talked to the guy, uh, at least not about his investments, but showed one of the powers of, of rental properties. But yeah, there's a lot of different moving parts. Um, every individual is an individual living in there. Um, I know in Fort Collins, there's restrictions yeah, on- U plus two. Yeah, exactly. So Fort Collins is a college town, Colorado State University. There's restrictions on, it doesn't matter if you have a seven bedroom home, you're only allowed to have, I think, three people uh, non-related living in there. Right. So you have to understand those things. You have to understand, um, you may be getting, if there's three tenants, you may get three separate checks. So how does your lease account for that? If one of the three doesn't pay, do you kick all of them out? Do you just kick the one out? You'd have to understand those things. Um, do parents co-sign? Is that a thing? How does that and look? By the way, that's a good thing for you. You can get parents to co-sign. Deep pockets. Yeah. So there's a lot of different yeah. moving parts. But absolutely look into it. You know, I mean, it is a very, very legitimate way of specializing. Yeah, absolutely. Just like Airbnb, yep. just like house hacking. Like there's, there's so many great things you can do uh, when it comes to real estate investing and you can make a lot of money, but understand all those moving parts and make sure you're comfortable with having college students. Yeah. You know, what's the question? I'm yeah. joking because hi Harlan, who I've been working with for a decade. And yes, I owe April, your daughter, a phone call right after this because I was doing texts. So I listed her. <laughs> okay. Harlan said, Charles, your aha moment 
and best and worst deal and why off oh, brutal okay my aha moment i don't know was was basically realizing about 19 years ago i wasn't nearly as smart as i thought i was like all the things i'm telling you not to do it's because i did it because i thought i was smarter than everybody else and i could figure stuff out and i was going to be this genius and i wasn't i was stupid so the moment it wasn't a moment it was over a course of years my realizing that i wasn't nearly as smart as i thought and that is that was kind of my takeaway my wor let me start with my worst deal my first fix and flip. Do you know this? You know the story? I don't. Know. So I my first fix and flip. I was off on my projected expenses by six hundred percent. I was off sixfold. Do the math. Ridiculous. Okay, that was bad. I, I hope to have, always have that be my worst deal because I was off by six hundred percent. And my best deal. You know, my my best deals have been mostly um, just buying and holding stuff and making tons of money. And I'm very proud of it. Um, just suffering through the downturns because I've gone through downturns and, and the crazy tenants every once in a while and all the kind of crazy stuff. But I think my best deal was, was falling ass backwards into real estate, buying my first duplex 20 years ago and hanging on and, and building a, just really great wealth and a really comfortable life. I, I don't have a much better way of putting it than that. It's been great. Yeah, you're yeah. doing the same thing. You're a little younger than me, and you're going to be saying the same thing in, in just a few years. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, all right. So, Winston, for both gentlemen, do you have any experience with fabricated homes, a.k.a. trailer homes? And what are your thoughts on those for buy and hold? You go first. <laughs> uh, just like we're saying about college rentals, uh, yeah, just as you can say about Airbnb is understand what you're getting into. Uh, I used to sell plumbing supplies for eight years out of college. Uh, and we would have some people come in looking for a water heater or for something else. Uh, and you can't buy a regular off the shelf water heater from where I was, you know, for a single family type stick built house because they're specialized, they're different. So repairs and maintenance will be different on a trailer. Um, you know, uh, there's lot rent, you know, you're paying rent for the dirt just because you may own the trailer doesn't mean you own the dirt that it sits on. So there's variables in that. Uh, is that a different play? Do you then want to own the trailer park and the dirt and, and not own any of the actual trailers? That could be a strategy. Um, basically, I know a lot of people who do it and they do very well at it. So if it interests you, then explore it and dive into it and, and test the waters. I get nothing. I've never actually done it. Just assume it's going to be fairly management intensive. So you better be getting a really good return to make up for your time. Yeah, exactly. So just make sure you, uh, you understand what you're getting into. As with all of these things, as we were saying throughout this entire conversation, understand what interests you, what excites you, what's going to get you out of bed excited, you know, when the, uh, in the morning when the sun's up and not what's going to get you up in the middle of the night, with a cold sweat and worry. Yeah, which by the way, we've all been through. So don't even like think it won't happen because it will, right? That's I mean, how you know what you should and shouldn't do yeah. is because you've done the wrong thing. Right, and, and, if you you can't, and if you can't handle that, you're not a bad person, but you may not want to invest in real estate because it is absolutely unavoidable. That's part of the game. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we made it to the end of our hour. Thank you so much for attending. Um, Charles, can people reach out to you? And if so, how? Yeah, absolutely. I would recommend not giving yourself one. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Uh, so feel free to reach out if there's anything I can do, you know, just uh, give advice or open a door or something, please. Um, you can email me at C Roberts, the letter C R O B as in boy, E R T as in Tom, S as in Sam, at your castle, Y O U R castle dot O R G. Feel free, happy to chat. So I'm teasing Charles because if uh, he was just on biggerpockets.com, uh, Bigger Pockets uh, podcast, and uh, I haven't get, slept in three weeks. I know. Apparently, I'm phone. not supposed to give out my cell phone, and I got crushed. So just trying to get back to hundreds of people, and it's been really fun, really entertaining, and I'm exhausted. I get up at four every morning trying to get back to people. <laughs> Uh, and so, of course, I'm Justin with Pine Financial Group. You can find us at pinefinancialgroup.com. Call our office just like somebody is right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> our office number is 303-835-4445. My email is justin at pinefinancialgroup.com. Uh, and you may have noticed if you're already on our email list or follow us on Facebook, uh, we have been putting out some, uh, some more content. We're trying to really focus and grow our YouTube page and put out some really good quality content. 
So if you are on YouTube, if you want to be on YouTube, if you want to follow us more, or even just come back and watch this video again, we're recording Someone this. Someone it's recorded, yeah. Yeah. So okay. Well, I mean, as long as I hit the buttons, right? <laughs> uh, it should be recorded. It auto records we'll, now, doesn't it? It can. Yeah. Oh, you don't. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, but go check out our YouTube page. We're Pine Financial. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube page. Hit that notifications button so as we post new stuff like this uh, webinar. Uh, you can find out when that's coming out. And if you're, well, I know you're sitting at home on your computer. Maybe you're on your cell phone. But either way, if you're on Facebook, shoot over to Facebook. We're, uh, well, I, I assume we're at Pine Financial Group. I'm not sure how that works. But <laughs> find pinefinancialgroup.com, like our page, and more importantly, give us a five-star review. Something happened years ago. We had a couple folks leave like one-star reviews. So I think we're back up in the fours now. But uh, actually, drop a review. Let us know what you think, whether uh, it's on the YouTube page when this comes out in a couple days or on Facebook. Let us know that you really uh, like the content, that hopefully we're putting out good content. Um, and just you know, connect with us on those different socials. We're, uh, we'd love to stay and chat with you. If you have any questions, reach out to us. We're both actively investing, doing deals. Charles is finding deals, yeah, properties. I bought, I, I bought one a few months ago for myself, <laughs> and I closed on one. Uh, on Friday, just a couple of days ago, for another client. Yeah, and I'm actively funding deals, and we would love to work together with you, regardless of what market you're in. So, thank you all for attending. Appreciate you coming out and sharing your evening with us, and we'll catch you next month. Thank you.